Flint has a cultural center, the Vehicle City. Not a single public high school left in this town. The downfall of Flint started way before the water crisis. Parking for residents only, eh? Well, the only resident left here is this cat. Flint, Michigan, one of the most troubled cities in the United States. Let's go check it out. Oh yes, Flint, a city that used to be home to thousands of blue collar manufacturing jobs. It was once one of the nicest cities in the country. Some say that it was the wealthiest city in the country. But as they always say, great times never last. Oh yeah, uh, start the dramatic music. Thanks, appreciate that. Well, as you can clearly see from 400 feet in the air, the days of Flint being an industrial powerhouse are over. These days, Flint is more like an industrial wasteland. General Motors no longer employs 80,000 workers in the Flint metro area. Try 7,500. Well, this is going to be my second video in my Flint series, and in this video, we'll see this area of the city. And in it, there are plenty of industrial ruins and some beat up residential neighborhoods to go along with it. We're going to start this driving tour of Flint's north side by heading east on Stewart Avenue before heading south on Industrial Avenue, which is right next to Flint's old Buick City assembly plant. And if we pull up the drone shot that we were just looking at, we are approximately right here where we start the driving tour. During my last Flint video, you saw some of the good things that Flint has going for it, like the cultural center, the fact that there are three colleges that surround Flint's downtown core, and you saw that Flint's main drag, Saginaw Street, is full of open shops, bars, and restaurants, and other businesses, at least the stretch that goes through downtown is. And what you saw in that video was pretty much the best of what the city of Flint has to offer. Unfortunately, the rest of the city is extremely depressing, and I'm putting that nicely, because as you drive around the land that makes up the city that we call Flint, Michigan, you'll see more abandoned school buildings than you'll see actual school buildings, you'll see more abandoned houses and vacant lots than you'll see occupied houses, and you'll see shuttered businesses up and down all of Flint's main thoroughfares. One of the biggest reasons as to why this is, is because of the deindustrialization of Flint, as it might be the hardest hit Rust Belt city that there is. Other suitors for this title includes Youngstown, Ohio and Gary, Indiana. Just like Detroit, Flint has a strong automotive heritage. You could say that the auto industry was even more important to Flint back in the day than it was for Detroit. That's because Flint was the poster child of company towns, General Motors being the company that had all of the power over Flint. Well, across the street from this row of abandoned buildings, or should I say fire hazards and vacant lots, is the site of the now vacant and demolished Buick City. From the streets and from the air, as of 2022, you can see thousands of unfinished GM trucks being stored at the site. 
Even though GM doesn't own the site anymore, these trucks were assembled at Flint's last standing assembly plant on the southwest part of town, and the company is waiting on the supply chain to improve so that they can put in the final touches on all of these vehicles, as the microchip shortage continues to be a thing for the U.S. economy. The site is massive, as it spans for 413 acres. At its peak, the facility employed as many as 29,400 workers alone. The site was made up of numerous plants in which most of them closed in 1999. During GM's bankruptcy in 2009, GM was forced to sell this site to the Motors Liquidation Company. With that said, there is a smaller complex of plants on the north end of the site along Stewart Avenue that remained open until late 2010 despite the selling of the property, as they continue to manufacture parts for vehicles including the door hinges for Corvettes and Cadillacs, along with transmission components for multiple GM models. We're going to come back to Stewart Avenue later as we're going to go back to where we were as we're taking our lap around the Buick City site. Shortly after selling the land, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency began their plan on cleaning up the site as pollutants have contaminated the soil and the groundwater for many years. The site received $33 million from a federal trust for the cleanup efforts according to this MLive report from 2010. Recently, an industrial real estate company called Ashley Capital has purchased the site. The spokesman said earlier in October of this year, 2022, right around the time of me making and uploading this video, that they needed $17 million in grants in order to start the cleanup process. The company says that they never go into buying old sites and expect grant money, and you're probably sitting there like, <laughs> Yeah, sure, okay. However, the company has nearly 350 properties throughout 14 different states, and they claim that this is the first time that they've ever needed grant money for ongoing cleanup efforts. Wait, does that building say the Buick City Event Center? What kind of events are held here? Is there a massive paintball tournament held here every year or something? It'd be a great spot for it. GM might want to find somewhere else, though, to store their almost new cars. Well anyway, Ashley Capital blames nobody other than General Motors for the reason why it's going to cost so much because when GM demolished the buildings they left the massive concrete slab over the 400 plus acre site along with all of the old and outdated and unused underground utilities in place. With that said, the Flint City Council approved $2 million in grant money through the Mott Foundation along with an extra $3.25 million allocated through the American Rescue Act funding. At least something is finally being done with it because it is a massive site that uses up much of city property and if it can eventually be put to use where it's collecting tax dollars instead of just sitting here as a brownfield site, well, do I really need to explain why that would be a good thing? And hiding behind the bushes, you can see a security guard. They probably didn't want to be in the video. That's okay. But yeah, they probably have a huge fleet of security guards to watch over this lot. I mean, there's hundreds, if not thousands of new GM vehicles, or should I say partially new GM vehicles just sitting around here. So it makes sense. Wait, is that a park to the right? Does anybody even use it? Sure is a park, surrounded by the concrete slab that is Buick City. Maybe there's some good bird watching, that is if you like seagulls. Alright, well, Ashley Capital argues that a big part of the reason as to why the site has been sitting here blighted for two decades now is because of the fact that it is such an expensive endeavor to just simply clean up the site and make it safe for future use, and if you think about it, it's like a $17 million investment, and companies want to see their money grow through their investments, not shrink. 
And with Flint being in the condition that it's been in over the last several decades, no companies with funds as deep as Lake Superior were interested in giving it a chance. Until now, so hopefully something can be made of the site, and it can be a positive thing for the community. However long the project takes, that is, because it's definitely a multi-year project. And sitting directly across the street from the old Buick City site is this company, Lear Corporation. And it looks to be a nice shiny spot in an otherwise depressed area. So that's good, I guess. The road that we're on here parallels the almighty Flint River to the left, and to the right it's some industrial warehouses that actually appear to be in use, despite the piles of trash along the fence, and it's all mixed in with some vacant lots. Well, let's talk about why General Motors has moved so many jobs away from the city of Flint. To help illustrate, General Motors used to employ around 80,000 Flint residents during its peak. At least, that's what they say, and that's not Genesee County residents, that's not Flint area residents, that is Flint residents, 80,000 of them. Today, the city of Flint only has 80,000 residents total, down from a peak population of 196,000 in 1960. And General Motors is said to employ only 7,500 workers in all of Genesee County today, so that's quite a big change. That's a change as big as, let me do the math here, that is about 73,000 employees down from its peak. Even in a 60 year time frame, that's a huge change. But yeah, with that said, General Motors is still the county's largest employer, believe it or not. However, the auto industry combined doesn't have the largest workforce in Genesee County anymore, as it now sits in second place to the medical field, which is pretty much the case with all Rust Belt cities these days. Go to any of these old cities in the Great Lakes Rust Belt region, you go to Flint, Detroit, you can go to Buffalo, New York, you can go to Pittsburgh, you can go to Erie, Pennsylvania, go to any of these cities today and you'll see just that, that the medical field employs more workers than any other field in their own local economies. We're now heading north on the eastern edge of the old Buick City site, but yes, General Motors. This is a subject that always brings up various strong opinions, thoughts, and feelings from many different Michiganders as so many family trees were affected by the massive amount of jobs that were lost. Those jobs being the ones at assembly plants that once employed so, so many in southeastern Michigan, especially in Flint. There is even a controversial documentary called Roger and Me that came out in 1989 that expressed how the far left felt about GM's decisions over the years to close down plants and lay off workers. Well, what doesn't get talked about much is that the auto industry still has a giant presence in the local southeastern Michigan economy, specifically Metro Detroit, which isn't that far south of Flint. But after watching all of the news stories and reading all of the headlines over the years, some people might be led to think that the auto industry has completely disappeared from Michigan, but that it has not. The jobs that have hung around the region are more so in the tech and engineering fields rather than the thousands of frontline factory jobs that used to employ so many. There's only a small percentage of those left, not only in Michigan, but also in other Midwestern towns that relied on assembly plants from GM, and they're scattered all throughout the Midwest. So there are two stages of General Motors leaving Flint on the city's timeline. The first stage doesn't get talked about much as it began early on in the 1940s. At this point, GM was near its peak in terms of employment in the region as people from down south heard about the jobs and how it could give them a shot at living the American dream, Flint saw a boom in population. So without General Motors, it's safe to imagine that Flint would likely be nothing more than a city the size of Lapeer, which is not that far east of Flint. 
Meanwhile, you've got these rectangular shaped cement blocks at each corner of the intersection of Stewart and James P. Cole Boulevard. Interesting. And now we're going over the railroad along Stewart Avenue, which probably gives you the best view from a street that overlooks the old Buick City site. But in the 1940s, General Motors started to decentralize from Flint, meaning that they started to open up new facilities in Flint suburbs rather than opening up facilities inside the city limit, meaning that Flint wouldn't receive the tax dollars from the new expansions, and that money went out towards the suburbs. Between 1940 and 1960, GM built eight new industrial complexes in the Flint metro area, and none of them were in the city of Flint. Basically, the original facilities were becoming outdated, and it was cheaper to build new facilities further away from the city than it was to renovate and expand their existing facilities. So that would be the start of it all. And that part of Flint's downfall doesn't get talked about near as much as it should, because it took away much of the city's tax base. Decentralizing and opening newer modern facilities in the suburbs was a strategy that all of the big three automakers implemented during this era from the 1940s to the 60s, and I talked about that as well in a video through my Detroit series, and you can see that video by clicking in the top right corner of the screen. And now we're in the residential area of Flint's north side as we're getting further away from Buick City and soon we're going to be heading south on Saginaw Street, which is a disaster in its own right. Anyway, Flint attempted to annex the land that these new GM industrial plants sat on, but they were unsuccessful. There was even a countywide government plan called New Flint that was proposed in the late 1950s, and the goal was to consolidate Flint with all of the unincorporated suburbs that surrounded it at the time to form one regional government. If this were to have gone through, we might be looking at a completely different Flint today. Well, obviously, the plan never went through, as it was met through great resistance from the people who lived in the outlying areas of Flint. These suburbanites came up with a plan of their own to prevent it from happening, and the suburbs won the fight over the city. Therefore, Flint was never able to expand their land to collect the tax revenue from these new GM complexes. Side note is, as we go down this street, keep in mind that this is supposed to be Flint's main north and south thoroughfare. It goes right through the heart of the south side, through downtown, and through the north side, and man oh man, does it look beat up. Well, I haven't yet talked about the infamous Flint sit-down strike, which was a three-month occurrence from December 1936 to February 1937. You can't talk about General Motors and its relationship to Flint without talking about this, as this strike played a major role in the history of the auto industry in not only Flint, but in the entire country. This was the very first major strike within the auto industry where workers fought for higher wages. This also helped form the UAW, or the United Auto Workers Union as during this strike, several other independent unions consolidated to form the UAW. Flint even has a freeway that runs through town that has the nickname of the UAW Freeway, and my oh my has the union backfired on the community, as over time, it's helped encourage plant closings and layoffs. And this is a touchy subject for many, I won't talk about it forever in this video, but with the UAW fighting for higher wages and having a strong regional presence over not only Flint but also Detroit, that only encouraged General Motors and other automakers to move their jobs to states further south, where unions had much less of a presence during the 40s and 50s, and eventually out of the country altogether. Some call that corporate greed, while others can see that over the years, the UAW in the long run had an unrealistic demand on how much money the factory workers should make. This money would also come in the form of pensions and benefits. Well, in return, this movement caused budgeting challenges throughout GM, Ford, and Chrysler, and that ended up running down the quality of automobiles, while at the same time running up the costs to purchase them. How many times have you heard that Toyota and Honda make much better quality cars than Ford, GM, and Chrysler. Well, if you remember the Detroit Big Three, GM, Ford, and Chrysler, they received a bailout package from Obama in 2009. And now I'm not saying that the union is to blame for all of that, as it's poor decisions from the companies themselves that led them to financial trouble, but the union didn't do the companies or southeastern Michigan many favors when it was all said and done. 
as when they were being bailed out, all three, GM, Ford, and Chrysler, owed billions of dollars to the union. Wait, did you hear that? Half of my viewers just left their seats while screaming at me in the comment section. Well, anyway, let me say this. It's documented that before the strikes, auto assembly plant workers in the 1930s made significantly less than what was then considered poverty, and the union changed that, so that was a good thing. Working conditions were also considered to be very poor, and the union helped change that, so that was a good thing. My opinions on that are that the union started out as a good thing, but it ended up being a bad thing because over the long run, they would never stop fighting for higher wages, and ultimately the price was just too high for GM and other Detroit automakers to keep all of their manufacturing operations in the area. These companies were forced to move overseas. Once again, this wasn't just the fault of the union, as national politics played a role in the decline of cars being made in America as well, but... Anyway, the sit-down strike was a way for these workers to fight for higher wages, as obviously GM needed their workers in order for the company to make cars and sell them. Going back to what I was saying with the Flint sit-down strike, it was a three-month period, and after three months of workers sitting around and playing poker and having food being delivered to them by area union leaders, GM President Alfred Sloan approved a $25 million wage increase across the company payroll. Other plants in Detroit had heard about the success story and then they proceeded to strike as well, which led to pay increases across the board, as UAW membership went from a low 30,000 all the way up to 500,000 in no time, and they gained membership from going from plant to plant to plant. And if you recall me saying how GM had started to decentralize their operations from the 1940s to the 60s by building eight new facilities in the suburbs and none in the city of Flint, this is largely why that happened that way. The idea was that if there were more facilities spread far enough away from each other, rather than having 29,000 employees crammed into Buick City, that a strike at a plant, if it were to happen again, wouldn't have as much of a negative impact on production. Today, the union has about 400,000 active members and over 580,000 retired members. So there are more retired members than there are active. At its peak, the UAW had one and a half million active members. Side note, as this is the Flint Oak Park United Methodist Church, construction on this building was completed in 1916 while the church was discontinued in 2001. Well, that was part one as to why GM has left the city of Flint, so let's fast forward to the late 70s and early 80s as during this time period, Flint has already started to decline. Not only had GM moved most of their operations outside of the city limits, but the city was seeing other issues as well, such as segregation, racially and economically. So you had white families moving out to the suburbs while black families stayed, not to mention many of these black families were living in poverty. There were also white families that stayed too, but they were also likely living in poverty. This all means that Flint was losing its tax base at a rapid rate, so Flint was already declining, but Genesee County overall hadn't yet started to see that decline as the area as a whole continued to see consistent population growth. But during the early 80s in particular, GM started announcing massive waves of layoffs, which eventually turned into plant closings. This was a part of the national trend of companies moving their manufacturing operations overseas, and since Flint relied heavily on these manufacturing jobs, the area was severely affected. Ultimately, Flint was a company town. Flint was never a huge city, but it wasn't a small city either, thanks to General Motors. 
Among the worst mistakes, though, that Flint has made over the course of its existence includes relying solely on not only one industry, but also one company. I mean, there have been other companies with numerous employees in the Flint area, too, and not all of them have been in the auto industry either, but none of these companies had a presence in Flint close to the scale that the almighty General Motors did. At one point, they said that you could talk to anyone in town, and some way, somehow, that person that you talked to would have a connection to General Motors, whether they worked there themselves or had a family member that did. But that's definitely not the case anymore. And straight ahead, you can see that we're just north of downtown Flint as we turn into a surprisingly decent looking housing subdivision called University Park Estates. And this is the last place that we'll see in this video. Along with this little neighborhood being named University Park Estates, all of the streets are named after colleges too. After a quick search on Zillow, it looks like most of these homes were built around the year 2000, which is around the same time, ironically, that the Buick City plant closed for good. Alright, well I do end the video here, and if you enjoyed this video, do me a favor and make sure that you hit that like button, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so that you can be notified every time that I upload a new video. Also make sure to check out my second channel, which is linked down below. I'm trying to get 1,000 subscribers on it by the end of this year. And if you enjoyed this video, you might enjoy checking out some of the featured playlists on this channel. Videos with amazing insights on other places like what you saw here can be found in my Flint playlist, my American Hoods playlist, or in my Michigan playlist. Last but not least, if you can't get enough of me on here, you can always go follow me on my other social media accounts, and those links are below. We'll see you next time. Peace!